So I'm here this morning with Tom Wambeka, and he's going to be giving a keynote this afternoon on technology-enhanced learning and how it's influencing um, our, uh, how technology is really influencing the way that we teach and, we, and that we learn. Um, I guess my first question is kind of a general question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see technology-enhanced learning impacting education in the broadest sense? Okay. Well, it's an interesting um, entry point because if you're at a conference here like Eden, um, diving through all the different sessions, what I actually did in the last two days, extracting almost 120 different signals of the future, and I mean the future of technology-enhanced learning, going from uh, learning analytics to micro-credentials towards all kinds of, let's say, futuristic terms of mm -hmm. where actually education is, is driving us. What I think is more difficult for organizations and institutions, what do these future trends in educational technology mean for you as a professional, as a learning institute? Because as we are always aware, we are changing a bit slower than, let's say, the fast technological innovation uh, rhythm of, uh, of the tools that we are currently exploring here. And in my uh, presentation, I'm trying to give some foresight processes, which are basically conversational tools on how you can together with your colleagues actually create a future for your own, for your own institution. And that is happening through actually human conversation, not really through the technologies. They facilitate, they accelerate, but they're in function of the objectives that you want to achieve as a team. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you see the role of, of, of teachers changing um, with technology enhanced learning? Do you see the role changing? Well, there will be a tool if you look at the big change in tools that in the last 20, 30 years moved from a kind of one-to-all broadcasting type of uh, trend to many-to-many -many interaction, collaboration and communication and that all these tools actually are now nurtured towards how can we crowdsource collective intelligence in a very interactive way, then my role is in parallel changing as the whole teaching paradigm. I'm not anymore the sage on the stage moving towards the guide on the side and trying to guide and facilitate my, uh, my students in the proper, effective and efficient use of these uh, tools. So they become more enablers, facilitators. It's a parallel, let's say, relation on how we see now actually the, the profession of a teacher. The tools are actually following the same kind of direction. Of course, there's a gap between theory and practice. Not everybody is a kind of digital native surfing on these tools facilitating uh, these, these elements. But uh, you can see clearly uh, a trend, which is not new. I mean, it's already in the last 20, 30 years. It's only accentuated and em emphasized more and more, and also in this conference again. Mm -hmm. And the learner, where do you see the ro role of the learner? Is, is it also changing as a result? Um, wh what I see there, uh, um, that the learner, I don't see, less and less I see the learner as an individual kind of uh, learner, because I'm working in the International Training Center of the ILO, we're dealing with real life problems, and just to, to, if you look at, let's say, the, the migration issue, if you look at climate change, these are profoundly complex uh, problems. So we call them, yeah, there's a high degree of complexity. So if we want to address these kind of uh, challenges, uh, we also will need not only the one uh, expert, we will need a whole multidisciplinary team of experts trying to grasp the complexity. And as a learner, as an individual learner, I'm not there anymore to absorb anything from one specific subject matter domain, but I will need the skills, the creativity, the communication, the collaboration to work with other like-minded individuals to grasp, let's say, the issue that I want to learn about. So moving from individual learning towards more collaborative uh, learning. And there I see the role of uh, students uh, very much and hope that also translates into higher education and in, in, in universities and they have also been slow in adapting these new trends but as I said innovation is a very slow innovator sometimes for good reason but sometimes mm -hmm. for reasons that they probably will have to run a bit faster in this quickly changing land landscape. Okay. Um, one of the things that, that we've often talked about at these conferences is the digital divide that often yeah. emerges with technology. Um, do you see technology enhanced learning um, contributing to that divide, I increasing exclusiveness, or, or do you see it uh, increasing inclu inclusiveness? Yeah. It's a debate that you also can look at from different perspectives. Eh? 
you hear the, the classic discussion coming back between divides between uh, digital uh, uh, migrants and digital natives. You hear it coming back to the degree of digital literacy. You hear <laughs> it coming to access to infrastructure. Now, you see some things democratizing. For example, on the level of tools and infrastructure, thanks to the whole open source movement, thanks to the open educational resources, things became more accessible. Does that mean that there's more, let's say, uh, that there's no divides? Uh, I don't think so. Even some of the newest uh, tools almost reproduce some of the inequalities that were there uh, before. So that's why I say you can look at it from two uh, angles. I work a lot in, uh, in the African continent mm -hmm. where you would see these kind of traditional divides coming back, the reproduction of the digital divide. But on the interesting side, sometimes these, let's say, uh, groups or, or countries or institutions that you would say, okay, we're going to reproduce the digital divide here. Sometimes they're doing very quick loopholes and actually advanced in innovation much faster than, than others. The mobile mm -hmm. penetration of devices, in, in, for example, in Nairobi is really a good example uh, out of that. Again, we have to look at it. It's all its complexity. There's plenty of opportunities mm -hmm. which would reduce the digital divide. And we need to look at it also from a multi-dimensional point of view, not only in terms of digital literacy and digital infrastructure, digital uh, new codes that are actually are generating digital attitudes. So um, it's good that we can, I think these are debates that emerge and that will be redone almost on an annual basis in these type of uh, conferences. And also there, the complexity is rising. Uh, also, it's not anymore there is no or there is yes a digital divide. It, it depends also, it's very contextual also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you had an opportunity to attend a number of dis different sessions throughout the conference, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what role do you see technology uh, having within the different presentations, or, or how is it being presented? Uh, what, what are some of your impressions about uh, how it's been positioned within the conference and the presentations? Yeah. Um, what I like about the conference is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm jumping from innovation to innovation. You know, I dived into the micro-credential uh, sessions and explore all the potential and the possibilities there. I uh, really enjoyed the, the blockchain mm -hmm. session where we looked for new decentralized ways of uh, actually yeah, building relationships, contracts, even uh, assessment uh, systems. Now they inspire, uh, but there's still a gap between you know, getting inspired by some of the new trends and really effectually also using uh, them. So far, I haven't heard anyone who actively used blockchain in an educational mm -hmm. uh, context. So that is also what I'm going to handle in my keynote. Okay, you get a good idea, but how you really start, I think it's with one of the quotes, if you want to uh, do something, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Mm -hmm. So basically start doing something on, on a small, scale and then basically lessons learned uh, from that and it's from many of let's say the new trends uh, I only name two but I can call also the learning analytics and that's from the kind of hyped buzzwords that you see in annual conferences we also see very concrete projects what is nice also that you see that some of the terms that were hyped 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm looking for example at the rise of MOOCs, mm -hmm. that basically they uh, reached a kind of maturity that people are already talking about, let's say big scale implementation, not everywhere uh, mm -hmm. again, but that they're not projected as you know the newest innovation, but that people now with a realistic perspective can say what is the added value of these kind of tools. Uh, the main lesson is maybe also because of my educational background is that we're not talking about the tools to talk about the tools itself, but what kind of uh, pedagogical added value can they bring to the conversation? And that's uh, where it really becomes interested. And then we're not talking anymore about pure technologies. Then you see the different subject matter expert backgrounds coming up, whether it's from an educational, whether it's from a very specific subject matter. That's also the beauty of this uh, conference, that you talk with people coming from chemistry, physics, with educational specialists, with anyone else, even people that you would not think that are active in the field of uh, distance education. It's not just, maybe that's a good thing. In other conferences, you would have a very specific profession with a very specific background. Well, here in the field of distance education, it's much more hybrid. It's mm -hmm. much more complex. So the diversity mm -hmm. of backgrounds also contributes to the richness of the, the conversation, I guess. You mentioned pedagogies. Which 
pedagogies do you see having um, a, <coughs> a, a stronger role within technology enhanced learning or within an environment that has more technology where technology takes a much stronger role? Yeah. Um, Are there specific pedagogies that... Yeah, well, what we need to get rid of is that we try to translate the, the, the pedagogy that we're used to from our traditional face-to-face -face learning mm -hmm. and just apply it into the new, let's say, uh, distance learning because then we're doing the old things in a kind of a new digital jacket and where we need to explore really the, the potential of new media and their new models are people, I mean, experts are constructing mm -hmm. uh, the, the new models. But it would be the same if I was said, I'm sitting here, I was sitting yesterday in the uh, aula, there were about 400 people, I was sitting at the last row, I was saying this is distance education because there's almost 400 mm. meters distance between me and, yeah. and the professor. So that would be also a wrong way of using terminologies, methods of one discipline <coughs> and apply it in another discipline where we really start to think from the discipline itself, come up with kind of new uh, models where the added value not only of the pedagogy but also of the technology adds something. For me it's really looking, is there something we can do with the technology that we cannot do uh, without, that, which I would unable be to do in, 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 like in a physical classroom. What I liked also that some of the new trends, for example, on augmented and virtual reality, we're not talking just for the immersive virtual experience, but I've seen at least two or three uh, keen or keynotes or speakers talking about social augmented reality. So mm -hmm. also that we use these kind of new immersive experiences, again, in a collaborative, communicative way. And that's maybe also the beauty in one of the, the conversations as technology is advancing so much that we're almost unaware of the technology. We're starting to concretely view what is now the, the human side, what is now the added value we as human beings can bring into this conversation. And that is making it rich again, not as again, I said, the technology um, itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have one last question, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, what did you enjoy the most about the conference or being in Genoa? Um, actually, uh, I'll, uh, I'll answer this with a very technical term. It's called acceptation. Mm -hmm. And acceptation basically means that you learn uh, things, again, from a completely different discipline that you never have expected and you try to um, actually insert some of the lessons learned from that domain into your own domain. And yesterday when we had this beautiful uh, dinner at the aquarium mm -hmm. uh, uh, out there where we were sitting next to the dolphins, I had a discussion where there were 14 things you could learn from um, dolphins. And there was one guy specialist in, in, in biology telling me all kinds of things that dolphins only use half of their brain while they basically sleep to be able to wake for predators. So that means that they can run about 15 days without actually sleeping. So looking at some completely different materials and trying to extract insights for the learning that we are mm -hmm. doing is kind of inspiring. And I think these moments of, I mean, it happened now in an informal talk at the aquarium, but it also happened here at a coffee break with some <coughs> people that I have, the moments where you expected the least, the kind mm -hmm. of serendipity, that's what I would nurture in conferences like Eden, besides, of course, the interesting keynotes and, and the sessions that we have, but we need more time where informal learning, where unintentional learning could create it. And of course, Italy, I live and work in Italy, is a very enabling environment for that. Great. Well, thank you for taking the time this morning to, to talk with me and to share some of your thoughts about technology enhanced learning and impressions about the conference. And good luck with your, your keynote this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you.